Luke 24, I was going to go and read the whole chapter, but I'll rather just draw our attention to a few key verses here. And uh, not just because we're all excited about babies and spending time in that, though that was a, a good use of our time. But the chapter as long as it is, and I see that we actually read it, I believe, last year, probably at this time as well. But in Luke 24, I specifically want to draw our attention to uh, the response of the disciples um, at the resurrection. So verse 37, Luke 24 and verse 37, <clears throat> the Bible says, But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. What a response to verse 36. It says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be still. And the response is, Terrified, affrighted, troubled as a result of Jesus standing there saying, Peace be still. Verse 39, it says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, Jesus affirming that it's him, it's, it's, it's me, it's, it's my presence, I'm not a spirit. He says, Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me to have. Verse 40, And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And so he speaks the word, a spirit hath not flesh and blood, and then he performs the act of allowing them to touch, to handle him, and to see that his word is true. Verse 43 then, it says, and he took it and did eat before them. So after he shows his flesh and bones, he says, I'm hungry, have, have you any meat here? And so We've just seen the disciples go from terrified, affrighted, to troubled, to Jesus showing himself to have flesh and bones, eating in their midst the food that they prepared. And now look at verse 52. It says, And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And so they're having great joy and excitement now as we get into verse 53 where it says, And we're continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Joy, praise, comfort has come over them as a result of the journey that they've taken in these last few verses. Going from being terrified to now joyful. And that is as a result of the resurrection promise being fulfilled to them. Perhaps they didn't see it for what it was through the prophecy and through the teaching and through Jesus plainly saying what would take place Nevertheless, when they saw it, they, they witnessed it, they saw tangible evidence of it, now they are rejoicing. Jesus had come to show, and you can go to Romans chapter 4, to show them that what he had said was the truth, and what he had said had taken place exactly how he had said it. That he died for their sins, and now he has rose again for there and our justification. So in Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, Romans chapter 4, and in verse 11, the Bible said, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto him also. <clears throat> and so now we're seeing Abraham and how re he received of the imputed righteousness of God. Verse 12, it says, And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being uncircumcised. So he believed, became the father of all those that had righteousness imputed unto them because of the faith that they had given unto the Lord. And so Romans chapter 4 and over in verse 18, it said, Who against hope? Now this is Abraham again. Against hope, believed in hope. So when there was an opposition to having hope in God at this time, he believed in the one that offered him hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19, 
And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. So there's that against hope. His body, by the world's standards, would, be have, would have been considered dead at this time. It says, when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And so Sarah's past the age of having children and Abraham's past the age of being able to have children. Against that hope, there's no hope in that situation from the world's standards. He believed in hope and he showed then that he was not weak in faith, but rather strong in faith. Verse 20, it says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded, and that was, that's what it means to be strong in faith, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed unto him. And here's our key here. It was not written, it was not recorded, it was not brought to us here, preserved in our scriptures, for his sake alone, but verse 24 says, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, in Rome, or, and uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says, he, was, um, he died for our sins, is another way of putting it, died for our sins, or delivered for our offenses, and the Bible says here, and was raised again, for our justification. And justification very plainly just means to be made righteous. To be declared righteous, essentially. That's what justification means. It's, it's like, just as if I had never sinned. That's a little phrase that people use. Just if I. Just, if I, just as if I had never sinned. Okay? So you're made righteous when you are justified. So, again, Christ was delivered for our offenses. He died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures, and his resurrection is there for our justification. Okay, now, if you were to go back to Romans chapter 3, it says in verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So through the forbearance or through the long suffering or through the, through the grace that God had, he took of the blood of Jesus and accepted that as the remission for our sins. Why? Because Jesus imputed in that act righteousness unto us. He applied his own, sorry, <sighs> I'm going to sneeze. No, I'm not. <clears throat> he applied his own righteousness to us, through, and we receive that through faith in his blood. That's what the Bible is teaching here. And that's what Romans 3 deals with. As you go through Romans, the Apostle Paul, in, in true Apostle Paul um, method, he's building an argument for salvation and also justification of the believer. He starts in Romans 1, showing everybody's current sinful condition. He takes Romans 2 and essentially applies that to every man. Romans chapter 3, he starts to discuss the righteousness of God, which is received through faith in his blood. Romans chapter 4 then, he starts to then bring in Abraham, that example of receiving by faith that same righteousness that is offered. So he's highlighting the point further in this case. And then he begins to show us that there is, I believe, two types of justification that are, be, that are taking place here. Verse 25 of Romans 3, justification by faith in his blood, that is to the saving of your soul. That is your salvation. That is you believing on Jesus, putting your faith in his blood, and therefore receiving the righteousness by his blood and the imputed righteousness that comes as a result of it. Of course, Romans 4 highlights that as well. Then he starts to transition, I believe, into the second type of justification, and this is the justification of life. Romans 3.25, it says, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, and justification of life is as a result of his resurrection and his resurrection power. Now this is going to happen twofold. First of all, Jesus rose from the dead, 
for your justification, proved himself to be triumphant over death, hell, and sin, all those things that oppress you, so then you'll be absolved and forgiven of all of your sins that happen after your salvation as a result there. But also, he is allowing for you to be justified in the life that you live in order to have power of the promise that he had gave you to overcome and to live this Christ-centered, godly life afterwards. His resurrection, the primary purpose of it, is to give you power to live a righteous life. To make you righteous. Just like what, we, what we've been going through as it's been, follow me and I will make you fishers of men through Matthew as we've studied it. Jesus is making you righteous through the resurrection power that he has given us. And this is a resurrection promise that he has made to us. And so we'll see that as we transfer over what I'm talking about. Now, just for a minute, think for yourselves about James chapter 2. And you can go study that in your own time. The Bible says, was not our father Abraham justified by works when he da 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 And Sarah, or um, not Sarah, Rahab also, was she justified by works? Now we know that that's not talking about salvation. They didn't do those deeds in order that they could be saved. They did those deeds because they were saved. And that same statement, justification, justified, is applied to them in that case. They're justified then before men. They're justified that the faith that they have is, is real and is true as a result of them showing it out to men. And we know that the Bible records that both of those people believed God before that time. So they received the Romans 3.23. Um, salvation through faith in his blood, the propitiation came upon them. And they had righteousness for the remission of sins. They're saved, of course. But again, remember it says that those two were justified by works, and I believe that's the work that they've done before men, which justified the faith that they had. And this is what Christ is going to begin to talk about. Look in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, and I'll talk about this a little bit. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, okay, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So our peace with God, where before we were in enmity with him, he was an enemy of ours because we were lost in our trespasses and sins. We were dead to him, and therefore we were enemies with God. Now we have peace. We are justified before God by the faith that we put in Jesus Christ at that moment. There in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 is your salvation, your born again moment, okay? But watch, it starts to transition a little bit. He says in verse 2, By whom also we have, okay, so on top of the peace that we have, by whom, Jesus Christ, also we have access. So we're granted access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Remember the disciples for a moment and their experience. They were frightened at his death. They were terrified. He showed up. They thought they had saw a ghost. It wasn't until Jesus manifested clear proofs to them that they finally relaxed, and then they were able to stand and rejoice in the glory of God. That's, of course, after the fact that Jesus had died for their sins, according to the scriptures. Therefore, propitiation through his blood had taken place. Of course, they were saved apart from that act taking place, because it's always been by grace through faith. But if we watch the chronology of the scriptures, he died for their sins, according to the scriptures. And that made men fearful. That made men terrified. That made men without hope, against hope. They were to believe in the hope of the resurrection that was to come. And of course, they kind of stumbled at that, didn't they? Not like Abraham, who was strong in the faith. These disciples stumbled a little bit and feared. But now, access is given by that same faith into his grace. You stand in that. You rejoice in that. You have hope in that. That's activity that happens, I believe, after you are saved. Another thing that can happen and is a result of Christ's resurrection power and his justification of you is verse 3. It says, and not only, so we have, also we have in verse 2, and now, and not only so, so not just justified um, by faith and having peace through God, but you can stand, you can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In verse 3 it says, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation 
worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And this list reminds me of the one that we talked about from Peter before, where it's you're just growing and growing and growing and building upon and add unto your faith this and that, faith, virtue, and long-suffering, and all of these things. This is a Christian that is growing. This is somebody that is justified by faith, has peace through God, who is now able to grow, glory in tribulation, stand, rejoice in hope as a result of grace that you receive through faith. And so, then, what I'm talking about here in the resurrection promise that I want us to all get a hold of is that Christ gives you a promise that the hope of his resurrection is in you, the power of his resurrection is in you, and it's going to provide you all of these things in your life and help you along your journey of life and along your walk. Look, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, if in this life only we have hope in Jesus, we are of all men most miserable. Not only this life, we, we have an eternal life. We have an everlasting life, and that's to come, but we also have access to that everlasting life today. Don't you forget that. It's not just that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures. Yay, I'm saved, and that's it. No, 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 no. He rose again to provide for you justification of life, to provide for you power to stand, to rejoice, and to glory in any kind of tribulation you are going through. That's victory. That's strength. That surpasses all that this world has to offer. God's resurrection promise to us. So again, Romans chapter 5 transitions a little bit from talking about salvation, being justified by His blood, being saved from wrath through Him, and and having access to eternal life. Verse 21 of chapter 5, it says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is both the free gift of salvation, that's also your free gift of sanctification and growth and power, okay? Romans chapter 6 is where this teaching really starts to to hit home with regard to what I refer to as the resurrection life, the eternal life, the Christ life, the crucified life, the, the real life that a Christian has access to. Of course, we have hope to come when we leave this flesh and we'll be, we'll be raised incorruptible, but you got access to that same hope now. And if you can grasp this, your life will change in a big way because look what he's already said you have access to. You have access to grace, where you can stand, where you can rejoice, where you can glory. Do we not need to stand firm in the day that we're living in? Do we not need to rejoice more in the day that we're living in? Do we not need glory when trouble comes upon us? All of these things are life-changing events and life-changing things that Christ offers through his resurrection. So Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because some people take that stretch of their mind and say, well, if God's covering all our sins, if he's going to give us power to, to, um, you know, to, to be born again, to be saved from our sins past and future, and that's, that's what he's been talking about mostly, but like I said, he's transitioning. Paul just asked the question very plainly, should we just continue in sin? Then we'll just have more grace and then continue in sin and more grace will come upon us. Of course, verse 2, it says, God forbid. How should we, now watch this, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, We are buried with him by baptism into death. And of course, that's a picture of the true, what has actually taken place. So, those first four verses, first three and a half, are explained clearly over in verse six. He says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, For he that is dead is freed from sin. So that's exactly what he means there in verse 3. We were baptized into his death. If we're dead, verse 2, to sin. If we're dead to sin, how should we live any longer therein? Verse 7. He that is dead is free from sin. Look, sin is not going to get a hold of a dead man. You just think of a body laying there on the ground. 
has no action, has no activity, has no resolve to, to get up, walk around, and commit sin. And this is the key that we need to understand. We need to reckon this to be true. Verse 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, laying there flat on the ground, dead as a doornail, cannot sin. Right? Why? Because it's dead. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And that's true. Reckon your old man to be dead as a doornail. Cannot sin. Know this. Understand this. It's crucified with Christ. Okay? Then if you go back to Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, the second half it says, that like as Christ was raised, okay, so we just talked about the death. We just talked about how we're buried with him by baptism unto death. Now we're going to get a simile and we're going to compare some terms. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So in the same way that Christ rose from the dead, even so we should walk in newness of life. We've been given a new life. We've been given an eternal life that is only in Christ. And as Christ raised up by the glory of God the Father, guess what? You are raised up by the glory of God the Father. And we should walk in that way. Walk as if you are new. Walk as if you are born again. Walk as if you are spiritually alive, 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 alive forevermore. And your flesh is dead as a doornail. Remember that. Verse 5. For... If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, which Paul is very clear we have been, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And this is why when we do a baptism, we are acting out what should spiritually be taking place at that time. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. The Apostle Paul says, if you're buried or planted in the likeness of his death, it's only to the end that you shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection promise. So, verse 8 begins to explain again what we've just found here. It says, now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And here's something again. You have to understand it, what's being said to you, and you have to apply it to yourself, and you have to reckon it. And you have to know this to be true. Not just in some philosophical way. Not just in some knowledge way. You have to reckon this to be true by faith. That's how you have access to grace every single time. If you want God's riches at Christ's expense, if you want God to give you something you don't deserve, do you know what you bring to him every single time? Faith. I believe you. I believe this. Just memorize verse 8 and think about that and meditate upon that. If we be dead, if I be dead, if I'm dead, I believe that I shall also live with him. If I'm crucified with Christ, in the ground, dead as a doornail, that I cannot sin. I am dead to sin. I believe also that I can, I am, rather, risen in the likeness of his resurrection, that I shall not serve sin. That's what he says in verse 6. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. There's a choice to be made, but our choice is made in the battleground by faith. That's where we make our decision. It's not just like, I'm not going to serve sin. I'm not going to serve sin. I'm not going to serve sin and building myself up. I can't sin. I'm going to get up today and I'm not going to look at that same thing. I'm not going to do that same thing. I'm not going to smoke that same thing. I'm not going to drink that same thing. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. No, no, no. You've already failed because that's not faith. Faith is when you say, God, help me. I believe your word. I believe that I am dead. I, I trust what you're saying. God, make me alive. Who's going to raise you from the dead but God himself? Who raised Jesus from the dead but the Father? Raised by the glory of the Father, and you have to be raised the same way. AA is not going to help you. Going to self-help books will not help you with this truth found in Romans chapter 16. Faith is what you need to give to God and let Him work with that. Continuing on in verse 11, and this is, this is the bottom line of his teaching. He's, sorry, verse 10, For he that is dead, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. In verse 11 it says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves 
to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon yourselves to be dead. Verse 12 it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So what is he saying? When you reckon something to be so, you are, you are essentially saying, I'm not going to let sin reign in my mortal body. What else does that mean? That means you're not going to obey the lust thereof. Verse 13, it says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But what you should you do rather, it says, but yield yourselves unto God. So look, when you reckon yourself to be dead, what you are believing, what you are trusting, what you are applying to yourself by faith is you're saying, look, Look, sin can't reign over me. Look, a dead man cannot obey lust. It has no lust. It's simply a corpse. You're saying the members can't be yielded unto sin because you pick them up and they'll fall back down. I reckon myself, my old man, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Verse 13, it says, But rather we ought to yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So from the Christian perspective, by faith, I'm reckoning my old man to be dead, has no access to sin because it can't even make conscious decisions. Dead as a doornail. Then I'm yielding my new man to God as one raised from the dead and allowing him to take control of my members. And that's what yielding means. When you come to a stop sign and you have the yield, you simply wait and let others move first. Let others move first. Let others move first. And that's what the Christian needs to do with his members, with his eyes, his ears. Careful little eyes what you see. Careful little ears what you hear. Careful little hands what you touch. Careful little feet where you go. We teach to little, little kids that, that little song. But that's what we're essentially doing is we're yielding all of our digits and all of our faculties to God. Letting him take control of them so that he can use our members as instruments of righteousness unto his own glory. And this is a promise and this is a gift as well. He says, verse 14, For ye are not, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And there's a promise. Sin will not have dominion over me. Sin will not have dominion over me. And there's a promise in the scriptures. It shall not have dominion over me. Why? Because I'm not under the law. I'm not subject to the laws. A dead man can't keep laws. But I am under grace. And that's the same grace that I believe is being discussed in Romans 6.23. Yeah, we use this as a salvation verse where it says, For the wages of sin is death. In other words, when I sin, I'm paid in death. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But if I give God faith, he gives me eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal life is the resurrected life. That's the same power that Jesus Christ currently walks in. And that's the same power that you have access to now as a believer. Verse 15, it says, what then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God forbid, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So again, this isn't talking about salvation. This is talking about a saved man yielding his members to one of two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve the Lord and Baal. You can't serve Jesus and follow the scriptures and also follow your own carnal mindset or your self-help books or your politicians or whatsoever. There's always going to be a conflict there. You either fully serve God by faith or you fully serve whatever else satisfies you. So he's saying, whoever you yield yourself, in other words, whoever you give power over you, whoever you give control of your members to you're his servant and that's who you obey either you serve sin unto death or you serve obedience unto righteousness and most christians want to be in the walk of righteousness 
verse 17, it says, But God be thanked. Now look at this. Look how he deals with the Roman church here. God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So ye were in full control, full grasp, a servant of sin, death, and hell, and the devil. Just gripped and grasped. But God be thanked, God be the glory that ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered. You another use you receive salvation. What he's saying here is ye used to serve sin, but now you can serve God in newness of life. And again, this is another thing because Christians can still be servants of sin, can't we? I think we've all went through seasons where we were serving sin more than when we were serving the Lord. We've all been through times where we've stumbled and fell and messed up and what am I doing with my life? I'm, I'm so far from God. I need to repent and get back to Him. You need to remind yourself, reckon these things to be so. Go to Romans chapter 6 and understand that as far as you've gotten away from the Lord as a believer, you positionally still stand as close as you possibly could be. Why? Because you have access to eternal life you have access to the grace that he gives and that grace that he gives gives you power to stand against temptations to sin he gives you power to rejoice over the depression that comes when a christian falls to temptations he gives you power to glory in the tribulations and troubles and anguish that come upon you he gives you all that because of his resurrection promise what you need to do with promises is take them and reckon them to be so. I believe that. I want to apply that. God, I want you to work with me in that. That's the truth. I trust that verse by faith. God, now work that in me. Work that in my life. Make me conformed to this image. Make me a servant of righteousness, even now, as I know your scriptures say I am. <laughs> Look, because sometimes what the scriptures say we are in Christ, in reality, we're often way far away from it, aren't we? We're doing the opposite of what Christ would want us to be, but we have to understand that while we're practically over here, wayfaring, sinning, walking contrary to God and His statutes, we're just one step of faith to get back to it and say, I believe, God, you've made me your servant of righteousness. Now help me. And it's quick like that. God says, return unto me. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And so many times, He says, if you draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you. God's not... God's not, well, I don't think you've repented enough. And just, just turning his, his back or a cold shoulder to you. No, God's waiting, like we saw in the story of the prodigal son. Waiting and watching and hoping that his wayfaring son or daughter would return unto him. And would realize that the promise was always there. Waiting. Just because you walk away from the promise, you stop believing the promise, you stop trusting in the promise, you want to do everything else, the promise is sure. Why? Because the promise is in Christ. He didn't go anywhere. He didn't sell the farm. He didn't, he didn't stop loving you and caring for you. He's just waiting for you to come to yourself, turn around and come back to him. And when he's there, hey, the gift of God is eternal life. And it's available to you. That eternal resurrected life is available to you. Verse 19, he says, I speak after the manner of men. So here the Apostle Paul is going to get real practical with the Romans, right? He's walked them through... Um, who you are in the flesh. He's walked them through salvation and, and what that means. He's transitioned and, and talked about their redemption through the blood, how they're reconciled to Christ and how they now need to be. They ought to walk in. They should walk in the newness of life. Now he's going to get real practical with them. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of man because your infirmity of your flesh, because of the infirmity of the flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Okay, so even as, you, you, you remember that, right? You can picture how you, you let your hands control what you touched. You let your mind control what you thought. You let, you let your heart lead you wherever it will. You let your feet go to all the wrong place. You remember how you yielded your members to serve uncleanness? Remember how you yielded your members to iniquity and to iniquity and to iniquity and it just snowballed? Do you remember that? He says, even so now 
yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. And in our minds, we're like, that's hard though. Because we think to ourselves, you know what? And, they, and we always say this. <laughs> living a Christian life is hard. Getting saved is easy. Living a Christian life is hard. No. <laughs> if you believe that, you're defeated already. As easy as it was to give your faith to God and have righteousness imputed unto you, so easy is it to give your faith unto God and have righteousness imputed unto you. The righteousness that saves your soul and the righteousness which actually allows you to live a life that shows that your soul is saved. Those are both received by faith. And so the Apostle Paul here makes it pretty clear for us because I, I will testify that it was pretty easy to sin most of my teenage years. Just did what I want, went where I want, behaved how I wanted, right? That was easy. I woke up and I followed my own path, did my own thing, served my own master, which was essentially me. I, I, I found that really easy to yield my members, servants to uncleanness and iniquity to iniquity. But the Apostle Paul says, even as you did that, now just yield those same members, servants to righteousness. Now just yield those same members in the same fashion. He says, even so now, yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. Just do it. Why? Because when, when I did the wrong, it was just me yielding to my lust that took me wherever I would not, wherever I should not go. The Apostle Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? I let the dead man get up and lead me about into all sorts of wickedness. Okay? That's what happens when I'm a believer. But pre that, I had nothing to guide me, right? I'm simply just doing whatever I will. Now he says, even so, just yield your members, servants to righteousness. Do you know what you do? The same thing. Just say, you know what? I'm just going to follow the Spirit wherever He leads. I'm just going to follow God wherever He leads. And do you know what He does? Just takes control when you do that by faith, when you say, that's what I want, that's what I want to obey, that's what I believe, and God will just take you and do as he will with you. It's not any more challenging. It was easy to get saved. It's easy to be sanctified. It's still a faith position. Okay? That, that, that is so important. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is Christianity. And I, I don't grasp it because it's something that you have to grasp and hold on to it and not let go of it. And every day do that same. Knowing this. Reckon it to be so. Knowing this, our old man is dead, crucified with him. That body of sin is dead. You have to remind that this is the battleground. The battleground is reminding yourself of who you were and it's dead and reminding of yourself of who you are now in Christ, alive, alive, alive forevermore, even as Christ is. And now you can be used unto righteousness by God in his power. That is the resurrection promise that God gives us is that we are 100% sinless, even now. We just don't believe that enough to actually live it out, right? This is our, this is our problem. This is, this is the conflict of the resurrected, the crucified, the Christian life. How do we yield our members, servants to righteousness? By reckoning our members to be dead to sin. How do we reckon our members to be dead to sin? We believe that. We trust that by faith. Not because we've ever seen it practically done, but just because the Bible says it's so. We trust that we are crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Do you believe that today? Well, make sure you believe that tomorrow. Make sure you believe that the next day. That henceforth we should not serve sin, but rather we should walk in the newness of life. Why? Because even as Christ was raised, even so we should walk in that Christ life, that power, that resurrected power that he has given us. Verse 20, it says, for when ye were the servant of sin, you were free from righteousness, weren't you? I didn't have to worry about righteousness. I didn't follow righteousness. I was completely free to do whatever I felt like when I served sin. Verse 21, good question. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? So you are free from righteousness, serving sin, but now when you look back, or maybe now you're looking at yourself right now, what fruit do you have in these things that you're ashamed of, even as you sit here today? As you think back and you wonder about all the ways and you ruined your life, wasted your life, 
What fruit had you? The Bible says for the end of those things is death. Your fruit is just corrupt. It's just death. It's just decay. It's just rot. But verse 22 it says, But now, being made free from sin, remember? You were free from righteousness as you serve sin. But now being made free from sin, how did you get that? By serving righteousness and become servants of God, Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Your fruit is holiness and the end result isn't death, decay, and rot. The end result is life, everlasting life, and Christ calls it the abundant life. That she might have life and that she might have it more abundantly was the promise made, I believe, in the Gospel of John. He's making it pretty clear for us, I think, right now. And it's, and it's so clear that it drives me nuts when I don't just do it. When I don't just take hold of these scriptures and say, I believe that. Your promise is good. God, I want to follow you in what this word is saying. I want to know that I'm dead to sin, alive unto God. I want to be free from sin as I am today. That I could serve you and have fruit of holiness and everlasting life visible in my present life in the flesh. Would to God I could have that. And the conclusion is here, and it's plain. The wages of sin is death. You're going to keep just earning more death and earning more death. Earning more death as you walk in those things that you're ashamed of. As you do those, those, those sins of the flesh and, and yield, yourselves members to, yield your members to do those things. Of course, you're free from righteousness, but you're earning wages of death. But contrarywise, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So our choice is plain. Do we want to follow sin, serve sin, commit sin, let that dead body get up off the ground and lead us whithersoever it goeth, following all the lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eyes, pride of life, following after sin, Satan, and self? Do we want to let that thing get up off the ground? And lead us about? Or do we want to reckon it to be dead? Reckon it to be <laughs> toast. Flat on the ground. No power. No resolve. No ability. As it is. <clears throat> when Christians let our old man lead us about, it's kind of like that old movie, Weekend from Bernie's. Weekend from Bernie's. When you got to pick up your old dead man and you have to carry it around and it's just kind of, and then you have to let it lead you. That, that's what it's like. Because it is dead. Reckon it to be dead. Believe that it's dead. Trust that it's dead even as it is, as the Bible reveals to us. But, there is a gift. And that gift of God is eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin, verse 14, shall not have dominion over you. It can't. The body of sin has been destroyed. The old man is crucified. Reckon it to be so. Verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You are the recipient of a free gift, which is eternal life. And even as you did when you were saved, you reached out and you accepted that free gift and took it to you by faith in what the Word says, even so, now you can walk in eternal life, walk as newness of life, in newness of life, even as Christ was raised from the dead, you can live that way by simply reaching out and receiving that same gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And by faith, he simply says, yes, son, yes, daughter. And then leads you about, takes control of your members, guides you in the way that he wants you to go. But these are moment by moment decisions, reckonings, moment by moment faith decisions, deciding that you're going to believe the Bible instead of lifting your dead carcass up and following that into damnation and following that into trouble and into turmoil. The Bible says in Galatians 2, and we'll get there in the second part, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. That old man is dead, nevertheless I live. 
by the resurrected promise that God has given me that he will, if I give him faith, apply to me resurrected power. He will justify me before men. He will show who I am in heaven to men around me. And I will be able to stand and rejoice and glory in whatever comes my way. Because that's what God said. And I believe it. Every day, I wake up. That's what he said. I believe it. That's what he said. I believe it. And that's how you reckon these things to be so. What a God we have. His resurrected promise is yours. Just reach out and receive that gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Father.